here we go. All right, folks, we're gonna get started again for our last session. Um, and we're gonna be looking at some examples of enterprise budgeting on real farms. Um, so first, Sarah Klieger is gonna talk about some enterprise budgets on her diversified farm. So, as previously mentioned, I, um, I got some versions of that budgeting tool and I've been playing with it for the last week or two. And um, so I entered in some of our data. Can I make my watch? Whatever, okay. Um, I'm, time, I'm doing a time study right now. <laughs> uh, um, right, so. Um, I was in, I'm interested, and I think we're all interested in examining how yield is different between different um, varieties of the same crop type. And um, I didn't have really exactly the, the exact same crops to compare, um, but we're going to look at um, two different varieties of uh, Maxima winter squash and then um, two different types of peppers. So... Um, Larry again with the sweet meat squash. Uh, um, so this is the same information that I used in my uh, 2016 presentation about the uh, sweet meat squash. And look, it's our favorite um, spreadsheets going up there. Um, but just to call out the data that I entered here, um, we did 640 bed feet of the sweet meat in 2015. That's on a five foot um, bed and it yielded about 50 pounds and I've used this um, the product and broken the pricing down roughly into three categories um, the top row is $75 per pound bulk price um, estimating that I sold about 10 pounds that way or will by the end of the crop life um, at the medium packet price of 24 grams for 780, probably about 15 pounds will go that way, and that's $147 per pound. And then the small packet price of 8 grams for $3.80, and um, estimating 25 pounds will go that way for a uh, per pound price of $215. Um, I'm going to skim over some of the other stuff. I used the retail overhead costs of um, sort of made up number, $137,000 um, for 2017's retail overhead and assigned this crop a 0.68%. And so that's based on the what percentage of our total catalog sales um, this crop earned. So um, here's the spreadsheet with a lot of different fields in it. Um, the one thing I just want to call out here comparatively to the other winter squash is that um, we used to grow winter squash at two foot spacing in the bed, but we would skip beds. So um, in that uh, 640 bed feet, there were only 164 plants and um, that made the weeding cost higher because the canopy didn't close and that's reflected somewhere in this mess. Um, it's not a mess, it's beautiful, but you can't see it very well. Um, and so in the summary, uh, we see that at the prices that I entered at the beginning, um, this crop is potentially, the 50 pounds of seed is potentially worth $8,337. Um, in that area, but if all 50 pounds were to sell at $75 a pound, um, I entered that in the right side, I made up some fields, um, then that would be $3,750 um, before expenses. So then the variable expenses are, I did the math somewhere so I didn't have to do it, um, $2,482, that's our break even point in sales for this variety. Um, and uh, accounting for the expenses for with if everything were to sell at seventy five dollars a pound, then that would be two thousand two hundred and four net revenue. Um, so it's looking pretty good, I guess. Um, 
So the retail overhead that wound up getting assigned to this crop based on that formula I put in before, it's uh, $938. It's kind of a lot. Um, so we're going to compare that with the lower salmon river squash. Um, same cleaning strategy goes into two crops. We smash them. Um, and uh, if they land right on the side, then they nicely crack in half, and then they're easy to scoop that way with this shape of squash. Um, so we planted quite a bit more of this variety. It was 1,100 bed feet um, and didn't skip bed. So there wound up being uh, 500 plants in this space. And all in all, it was 60% um, more of the more field bed feet, um, two times the plant planting density. So we wound up with three times as many plants. And the yield was only 70 pounds um, for all of that. So um, not uh, a heavy yielder. The seed, though they are both maximas, the seed type is very different. The um, lower salmon river has like the woodier rind, and so the weight per seed is variable in that way. But um, the summary, um, right, so there were similar expenses, less per bed foot for weeding because of the canopy closed. Um, and the re retail overhead is much less because this is a less popular variety. So on this sheet, the retail overhead portion is only $400. So that 70 pounds though, if it all had sold at the $75 pound bulk price um, after expenses is $2,800 net revenue. Um, at the packet price or the price points as indicated, which are the same as for the sweet meat, the net revenue potential is um, $9,157. And I um, made a little spreadsheet here of comparing the two side by side. Um, so it's um, interesting to me that the seed yield per plant on the sweet meat in pounds, it's almost twice as much. Um, but the net income at the $75 a pound rate, it's fairly comparable. Um, and that's going into um, getting it, getting into the details of the different production expenses and space um, and everything. So, um, but at the retail price point, the Lower Salmon River comes out way ahead. The thing about this is it assumes that it's all going to sell, um, which uh, with that sweet meat squash, that was a 2015 crop. And so we've now been selling it for two years. Um, we're on year three of that seed lot. And with that crop, the, um, the break even for production was $2,482. And at the end of two years of selling it, we were at um, 2,500 or some or so. So it was only with the beginning of selling it for the third year that we began to be profitable with that crop. And so there has been mention of um, the expense of holding on to seed, the delayed um, income from it. Um, I mean, this is a pretty typical thing for us, actually, that it takes a couple years to turn a profit on retail sales. Um, Hopefully the um, sweet meat will last one more year and then it will be more profitable and hopefully we can sell it all. But um, again, there's no guarantee of that. Um, so um, quickly, similarly with uh, pepper, this is a sweet pepper that we grew in 2017, um, Bax Kai Fair Hair. We did 90 bed feet of it and um, wound up yielding uh, six tenths of a pound of this variety. Um, the retail overhead percent is 0.18%. It's not a super popular variety. Um, this, the 90 feet yielded 100 pounds of fruit and uh, it took us three and a half hours to clean it um, and an hour and a half to harvest all of that fruit. Um, and this one is um, much less profitable. The 
uh, if it was all sold at a bulk rate price, our net revenue would be $25. <laughs> um, so <laughs> not a big winner there. But at the packet pricing, as stated, our net revenue potential is um, 1100 Um And the break-even point for that one is, I think, $900. So the last two years, we've had about $900 in sales of that variety. Hopefully, um, we will turn a profit on that one before year three. And then compared quickly with the Korean hot pepper, um, this was on only 30 bed feet, as uh, Travis previously mentioned. The yield was about 20 pounds of fruit. It took about an hour to pick, 3.7 hours to clean it. Something to consider with hot peppers is PPE, not the most pleasant task. Um, but uh, so much of the same inputs for weeding and all of those things. Um, the, the summary is that even at the one third of the plant out size, um, the hot outproduced the sweet by um, more than four to one per bed foot. Um, and the time to harvest and clean it was less. Um, and this is our most popular pepper. So the chances of us selling this one all are, are much, much better. So um, <sighs> uh, so in conclusion, um, despite the immense amounts of additional work, seed packets can be profitable, but that's if and only if you can sell all that you are producing um, and matching production to sales projections is um, kind of a magical thing that sometimes we get right and sometimes we don't. Um, special thanks again to the Risk Management Agency <laughs> um, for funding this. Uh, and there's a better picture to look at than that one. <laughs> thanks. Um, now we have Sam McCullough from Nash's Produce, and he's going to know what charred seed budget in, budgets. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about two different types of crops, both charred seed, one contract crop to sell to another contractor that sells to seed companies, and the other that I am trying to grow in-house. or So the first one is I deliver dirty seed to that company. They clean it in-house, do all the drying, testing, sizing, decorticating, everything. I get a price per pound for that. I would like to do more of that in-house on our farm, not that one is better than the other, but we would like to be more of a direct sailor to these seed companies. Um, So the, this first one here is what we're going to call the contract seed workflow. Um, pretty, pretty common up to the point of delivery. Second, in, in-house clean seed, um, pretty much the same. There's a lot more weeding um, because we're going to clean it. Um, there's a lot more roguing and scouting. Uh, because this is our, this is a seed we've been working on for um, up to dozens of years. Um, so we're, it's a, it's a grow out. It's a, it's a production crop, but it's also still um, um, not stock seed, but it's, it's, uh, we're, we're still improving upon this. Um, and then of course, after, har of course, post harvest is going to be, that, that's the question. And so what, what I'm trying to figure out here is justifying the costs of buying um, improved equipment, mostly for the cleaning, sizing, decorticating, all that. That's, that's the hardest part of large scale seed production. Um, your, 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 your 98 percent clean seed um, is the easy part. The last two percent of cleaning that seed is actually more work most of you probably know as the, as a, the initial 98%. Um, overhead costs. 
inputs activities, not really much difference. You're still going to plant them at the same time, um, water them. Um, planting, we use our stock seed that we grow out. Um, the contractor provides us with their stock seed. Um, Input activities, like I said, cultivation on on the contract crop. Um, we're going to run through with probably um, in row tillers, S tines, um, no real hand labor. Uh, we can deliver them a pretty dirty crop. Uh, you don't want to deliver them the whole field. Um, they're 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 going to dock you a lot. They're not going to dock you on price. The people cleaning it are going to get pretty aggressive with it, and they're going to take out a lot of your good seed just because you delivered them garbage. So you still want to do a good job, um, but they have a multi-million dollar facility to clean that seed. So um, we have a uh, we we don't have that yet. <laughs> um, so we spend a lot of time on hand labor. After the machines move through there and they just can't do anymore, um, you know, labor, as you guys know, is hard to get. It's hard to get good labor, consistent labor. So um, that's that's a big challenge. The trade-off there is you're probably going to save money cleaning it in the field than docking it in, in your seed plant. Um, these are... These are two beet seed fields. This picture I took about two weeks ago. Um, they are large. It's about almost 20 acres of beet seed for contract, planted at the exact same time, treated same time, two different fields. Uh, on the left, obviously, that's what we like to see. On the right, there are beets in there. Um, if it was conventional, most of that's... Uh, most of that's wild oats and some mustard. Hopefully the mustard will freeze kill. It's not a huge problem. Those wild oats are going to take out parts of those crop. There will still be seed in there. Luckily, wild oats are there because of their shape. They're set. They're, they're somewhat easy to take out of a round seed like, like beets or chard. Um, so... That's our charred seed there um, last fall. One of these scenarios is our charred seed. The other is the clean weight, the actual clean weight that the contractor got back to me with actual clean weight in pounds that we got a check cut for. Um, um, our crop, on the other hand, we had a 70% failure. Uh, last winter was really, really cold up there. We would have, if this crop wasn't as anticipated and we needed um, mostly genetics, but also for production, we probably would have dissed this crop down. Um, so we took it through the winter. You're not gonna pull your disc out in the winter anyways and disc up a bunch of mud. So we let it go through the spring. It did canopy out. It actually, the 30% remaining did do a pretty good job. But we had such low yield on that that um, you know we're 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 probably losing money on it. At that point, you have already spent the money, though. You're it's pretty counterintuitive to keep spending money to make money, but I'm sure many of you know know the feeling. Um. So both crops are still you're still combining them, you're still swathing them, you're still combining them. Um, I'm pretty happy with our comp where our combines are at right now. There was years where um, I, I did not say that. The we used to take a grain head to and just direct cut most swath most swath crops. Then we found these these old Heston swathers. We got two of them for a thousand bucks. Pretty good deal. Um, so looking at this part of of uh, of the gra of the tool, you know combines. I'm happy where they're at. Wind drawers, every time I jump on that thing, I think it, it, I, I'm ready for it to explode. One of them is now a parts machine. The other one is like holding on by duct tape. And um, so looking at 
this tracking and all that, uh, you're, you're, if, if I was profitable in a, in a year and had money to reinvest back in, a swather would make sense in, in this tracking, these numbers would show, hopefully. Um, so post-harvest equipment, the seed cleaners, at this point, we throw it for the contract crop, we deliver it right in, or we unload it from the combine right into boxes, and we drive it about 90 minutes in a ferry right away. They forklift it off, and we're done. Then we are waiting on them to dry it, size it, clean it, uh, purity test it, germ it, all that, and once that's approved, um, you get cut a check. Now, normally that takes from harvest to about sometimes till April. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not cut. You, you still got to cover your costs till then. But with that being said, you're not having to pack it all that seed and sell it yourself, which might take two to four years. So, um, so it's in, in, in our, in our production model, it works to do both. They both are good income streams. Uh, um, seed cleaning the air the air air screen cleaner, um, pretty good. That's going to get your ninety eight percent of your clean, ninety eight percent of your seed clean. That's it right there. But these screens are for this machine are about three hundred four hundred dollars a screen, and you have them in sixty fourths of an inch and half sizes. So there's one hundred twenty eight seed uh, screens per screen uh, shape and then you have rounds you have ovals you have triangles you have brass woven so you could spend six figures on screens for this machine easily granted we don't need all of those screens we need size 5 through 12 say for beet seed and that's good um, so knowing um, you know again looking at your investments it took you it took me you know 10 hours or whatever to, to clean a thousand pounds. Well, with a better screen, I could have cut a couple hours off to that. Um, um, this is the easy part of in-house. Um, decortication, uh, that's, that's where the market's going now. Everybody wants sized seed with vacuum planters. Um, this is a 55 gallon drum with a horse and a half, I think, 220 volt motor with a bunch of metal shafts welded off of a shaft that's ran by that motor and you put about 150 pounds of seed in there and you run it for about one and a half minutes to three minutes and your seeds decorticated it's 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 home built it's cheap it works for me i'm happy with it i don't need to buy a 10 twenty thousand dollar decorticator right now um you know, we'll deliver 15 to 20,000 pounds of beet seed to the contract company. If I was ever growing that much for our in-house use, yeah, we would definitely need to upgrade machinery. But for this, that's that's fine. Um, spirals, again, I think I got 40 hours on this spiraler. That's a single core spiraler. They're about 2,500 bucks. Um, I could have a four core spiral and it'd cut it down to 10 hours, but um, you're talking investment and justifying those investments. Um, a Draper belt cleaner. Um, this is uh, for beets, beets and chard. I keep saying beets, but this is about chard. Beets and chards are almost identical. Um, for We have a lot of vetch in our fields because we cover crop heavy with rye and vetch. So we have a lot of volunteer. Vetch is the, one of the hardest to get out of beets and chard seed. Uh, the outer diameter of the vetch is the same outer diameter of a of a decorticated or or non decorticated charred seed. So this is just a Draper belt that's. Um, let's see what button. This is just rotating uh, up, and you can adjust the angle and the speed of the belt. So the 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 charred seeds have. Um, are, 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 you, you set your angle and speed so the charred seed is going to go get carried up and the vetch seed perfectly round a little little metal ball bearing almost is going to roll down. Um, we built it in the shop. Took, a, took, I don't know, 40, 50 hours tinkering in the shop in the winter. 
um, it saved us a ton of labor. Um, after that, you're sort of getting down to hand cleaning. And for 10 pounds, maybe up to 100 pounds, you can maybe do that. Um, you get up big scale, bigger scale, th there's no way. So again, you gotta, you gotta justify this cleaning equipment. Um, indent drum, again, there's, they're in 64, seven inch. They're about 940 to $1,200 a piece for this machine. Um, they do a really good job sizing. They're not a cleaner though. They're, they, they're just a part in the whole process. So if you want your nine to 10 size charge seed, you'd run it through a, probably a 10, a number 10 drum and that would size it all. Um, but you could have, you could have for, you know, we grow from carrot seed all the way up to large Windsor fava beans and everything in between. So we could have 50 of these drums. That's, that's 50 grand. Um, there's finished product on the left, non-decorticated, middle decorticated. Um, this is what we're dealing with. And this is why on, on the right here, you got vetch and what I call cleavers, and those little sticky balls that stick to your pant legs on those little vines. Though that and vetch is the hardest to get out of, of this. Um, and that's why it's it's um you know trying to delivering it delivering the whole field to a contract and getting paid at once and not having to deal with this uh i mean it's on a good year it's nice it's really nice um we've had uh one crop fail three years in a row though and the contract said we do not get paid that's a big hit so it would be nice to have our own seed that we could grow. We'd have, um, we could take the time and care to clean it, um, uh, dock it, size it, um, and hopefully get a higher net for it. And also offer the, the more upgraded our infrastructure and our seed plant is, hopefully the price of our seed that we can offer to different seed companies also goes down too. So then they went to, they can move more volume. We create more net. Um, it's all about strategizing your investment. And I think this tool is a good start to, to get better at that. Uh, so for me personally, I operate comfortable on my gut level. I can sort of feel when a crop is gonna make money and when it's not. The problem with that is I can't tell Tom to give me a higher price because my gut just says you should, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a good gut. Um, you know, your, your, your banker, whether you take out an operating loan or you have investors, they need these numbers. You got to have them. Um, hiring and training new employees it helps to explain why we're doing something that they they think is sounding sort of stupid or seems like a waste of time but you show them a spreadsheet you can explain it to them um just just it helps with overall communication um i think i still lean heavier out in the field on my gut i'm getting comfortable with tracking more um i'm a little skeptical i think um, I th I'm a little skeptical on, on the quality of the data sometimes, you know, information can be poison if your data is not correct or it's being used improperly. Um, we had an example where uh, we mixed up beet seed income with fresh beet income and real quickly we thought it was going to be a good idea to grow another two acre of beets next year. And then uh, we thought, well, wait a second, that's you know, that was as simple as somebody in QuickBooks just going through invoices, doing data entry, and they, honest mistake, accidentally put beet seed under fresh beets. Well, it was a big enough check where it threw it off to where it made it look like fresh beets were more lucrative than they were. So, yeah, um, tracking the data and also using your gut to, to, to question it and or, or, or back it up. Um, 
the the lesson learned with the charred seed crop was I definitely need to overproduce for at least two years of seed stock. Um, it's a, as long as germ, germ and vigor uh, uh, remains, you know, it'll make it easier dealing with larger companies where you have to go through five different quality assurance departments to the seed rep to the, you know, there's, there's systems set in place because the business has to have those checks and balances. I understand that. Um, but from somebody who's planting it, watering it, growing it, cleaning it, decorticating it, and then putting their sales hat on it and trying to sell it, you know, in house, it's a, and, and selling that to other farmers too. It's just a phone call away. Um, whereas larger companies, you know, it's, uh, you really need, uh, you really need that back stock inventory in case of a crop failure, or they probably already have it in their catalog. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? All right, we have one more look at um, some enterprise budgeting. And this one's actually going to use a different tool, so that'll be interesting to look at. All right, one more. Um, so enterprise budgeting is a challenge because, as you've heard, it takes a lot of data, and it takes a lot to capture that data. Um, Obviously, you want to know what the real cost and value of your crops is, right? Um, we all want to make a living, and so we're all trying to capture enough data so that we can change our farm system so that we're more profitable, among other things. Um, obviously, we're always wanting to do that in the context of personal values, so you might find a profitable way to do things that don't meet your other values, and that's why you're all here. Um, when I joined the project, I had already sort of started on creating my own tool using Wiswall's method. Um, so I went ahead and just continued with that process, and I'll show you that. Um, it's all it's based on time studies, like Tanya was talking about, and um, you know, time studies. One of the main points is you have to have the habit of doing those, and um, I'm halfway there. Um, and so I joined um, Tanya's cohort this year after trying to for a couple years. Um, and it's just really interesting, especially thinking about overhead and how to, you know, what is overhead, what is not considered overhead, and then how to allocate overhead and how to consider overhead um, and all of this. Because a lot of these tools, what they're best suited to do is to compare a crop to a crop. You know, so if I'm growing... Yeah, and and that's kind of relative information. So that doesn't actually give you the how much you have invested into the crop if you don't take into account the overhead. But figuring out overhead is kind of hard. Um, you know, I went I went ahead and how much do I pay for insurance? How much do I pay for this? And I've got a total number that I can then divide in different ways. And that's a question. You know, how do you divide your overhead? You divide it by uh, square feet, you know, or acreage, you know, per crop, you divide it by the value of those crops, you divide it by the labor you spent into each crop, there's different ways. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it's great talking to Tanya and, and trying to figure these things out. I don't have the answers yet, but I'm thinking about it. Um, and so, in doing this, project, you know, I came up with all these numbers, and it's like, wow, I'm really making a lot of money, which is not really the case. Um, <laughs> and so take all of these numbers with a big grain of salt because something is missing, you know. Um, and what I think is happening is that, you know, I'm looking for profitability and yes, I can compare crop to crop, but I'm also looking at how much does the seed really cost me to produce and then how do I just overall increase my farm profitability and I'm getting the sense that it might be in the overhead and the overhead isn't exactly necessarily only insurance costs and things like that. There's so much management 
overhead. Um, you know, because when you want to compare crop to crop, um, you know, Tanya just gave a, a quick introduction, but a lot of times driving to the field, you don't want to count that in your enterprise budget because you rotate your crop. So the year you grow that beet crop a mile away, the next year you might grow it 100 feet away. Yes, in those years it was different, but that doesn't really give you a good picture of what it takes to produce beets. And are you going to make the decision on whether to produce beet seed based on because you planted it further away or not? I mean, if you can suss all that out, that's great. But, you know, I guess you have to, what I'm saying is you have to be really clear about what you're looking at and what you want to get out of it. So if you want to compare crop to crop, that's one thing. If you want to look at overall farm profitability and a better system, that's another thing. And you're just going to look at the numbers a different way. So we've mentioned it a million times, yields vary widely depending on variety. And so I was just um, curious at looking at that sensitivity table that we looked at earlier, you know, because that's really where you're going to get an idea of what you're dealing with as you're growing crops. Um, you know, so these are the questions, you know, what's my break even price and how does that change based on variety? You know, and then you can use this information to negotiate better prices. You know, like Tom was saying, if we can document our production and say, look at these healthy plants, you know, they're full rows, everything's good. This is how much pounds of actual fruit we pick, not necessarily seed or whatever, show costs, and then say, you know, there's only this much seed in there. You know, maybe we can get a better price. And then obviously, especially looking at labor, if that's, you know, I know how much money I spend on everything else because, you know, most of us are doing the basic accounting, but in, with labor, you're like, where are you spending your time? And if you can find places where you're spending a lot of time, that's the where you want to invest your money. You know, you're always buying new equipment, thinking about it. So what's the best bang for your buck for the where your farm is at at a particular moment? So really quick, I'll go through overall enterprise budget. And if you guys have looked at Richard Wiswall's work, you'll recognize this. And I went ahead and tweaked what he did um, for myself. Um, and if you buy his book, it comes with some CDs and some uh, blank templates that you can uh, upload to your computer and, and play with them. But the basic structure of this is uh, you're just entering into the blue cells. Um, so here, 2017, lettuce. Uh, the standard area that I chose was one bed, which for us is you know, five by 100. Um, you put in a plant spacing. The labor cost, uh, that's a composite of a higher rate for a manager and lower rates for workers and um, at a certain ratio. So I don't have enough time to bring up the Excel spreadsheet and show you all of the parts of it. So I'm just going to, this is a quick summary, but the way it works is after you do all the time studies, you know, you're like, okay, well, it takes me X amount of time to get a bed red, uh, rototilled, or let's say plowing and disking. Those are the first two things. So every time I, I, t I time myself plowing, I time myself disking, I come up with a standard rate. I, well, hopefully I did it like three or four times, average that, et cetera. And so in the sheet that I made, all I have to do is say how many times did I do each of those things, and then there's a standard cost for each of those. There's a labor cost, there's a machinery cost. If I'm using an input, there's a place to put a product cost. You know, so there's there's bed prep, 16 bucks a bed, 17 bucks a bed. Um, seeds and uh, transplanting, so there's a tray cost. You know, I'd, I haven't gone through the process of figuring out how much am I actually investing when I do transplant production, you know, hopefully I'll get around to that this year. I just took a whiz wall number of roughly $7 a tray and plug that in, you know, and then, so what are all the things that you do? Row covers on, you know, weeding, irrigating, et cetera. Um, just trying to come up with all of those costs. Um, harvest, picking, cutting, swathing, threshing, cleaning, post harvest. Etc. You guys will all be able to see all this stuff again in more detail later. It's kind of 
not fun to just stare at a bunch of numbers. Um, so for me, when I take up my overhead costs, I get substantial numbers. Um, and I still think they're too small. So for one bed, I've got $165. Um, so if I add, add that to the $94 of variable cost that I came up with, I've got a total um, cost of $360 to produce that one bed of, of lettuce seed. So then, you know, like the other examples, you plug in what you got out of it. Let's say I got 10 pounds and sold it at 65 bucks a pound. That's 650 in total sales. So if I subtract that $360 of expenses, that means I got made $290. Uh, if I extrapolate that out per acre, that's $23,000 and or $35 a pound. $36 a pound is profit and $30 a pound is cost. But the thing is, if I extrapolate that out, I should have made twice the amount of money that I made this year. And I know that I didn't unless I lost it somewhere, but I don't think so. Um, so, you know, this was all, these are all like some pretty rough numbers. And like Sam was just saying, you know, it's all about the data that you're putting into it. So if the data you're putting into it is not very robust, you're going to get some weak numbers out. And so this year, my goal is to fine tune all of those numbers um, and then also look at when things go astray, you know, because things, if I go back over here, you know, and sure, maybe we do X amount of weeding and X amount of irrigating, but mistakes always happen and things, you know, it, it doesn't always just go exactly the way you plan. So how do you account for that? I mean, maybe that's overhead. Maybe that's a different way. But um, so here's where I took it after I got to, to this page. I was like, well, you know, I get paid a range of prices for lettuce. Um, you know, it can be as low as 45. It can actually go up to 100. Um, but this is... And basically, I just made myself a simple sensitivity um, formula where I can plug in three prices, I can plug in three yields, and then it shows me those different returns. So, you know, if I'm getting paid a low price and I get a low yield, then obviously I'm losing money. If the opposite is if you get a high price and a high yield, you're making more money. And so, yeah, it's just interesting to know what that range of potential is for any particular crop. Um, you know, and so I did the same thing for tomatoes. And the biggest change here is, well, there's definitely more um, cost of producing tomatoes, especially when it comes to labor. Um, you know, obviously the price is a little higher. You know, our average yield was 2.2 pounds uh, per hundred feet. Um, so actually our net return was a little bit less than the lettuce, mostly because the costs of production are a little higher, um, you know, and so and the sensitivity table shows more or less the same thing, you know, low price, low yield, you're in the negative, it's got some, got some good potential. Um, yeah. There's that. So I figured you guys will have some questions, and we've got, I don't know, X amount of time to bring Sarah and Sam up here, and the three of us will answer your questions. But yeah, I think that's all I want to say for now. I have a general question for maybe everyone. When we're doing this type of study, when, like, it's obvious maybe when you, when do you start and when do you stop? Like, is that, is it first disc to, of uh, the spring to the last disc of disking in your mode crop residue? Or what are, where are your starting and stopping points?
it's it's interesting because the fiscal year doesn't always follow your cropping year or you know tax year um for one example like cover cropping that was i put that in on inputs um, fertility inputs and so the the summer crop is going i'm i'm disking under a cover crop that came through the winter to then plant this crop but then once this if it's an annual once it's harvested then i'm planting a cover crop again for the next year's crop so i'm gonna i could attach half of the one and half of the other or just one of the one and one of the other but you know um yeah there's there, there's a lot of that stuff to think about um is tanya still here because <laughs> she's got a lot to say about these kinds of things because she's worked with so many farmers for the last three years who are, have been trying to figure this out um you know so if you want to compare crop to crop then you want to just time when it's you're actually working on that crop so don't do your travel time you know get there then as soon as you start working on that that crop is when timing and when you're done working on that crop is when you stop timing and then all the other time, the time of setup and getting there and all of that is part of your overhead. Uh, I just usually use from mowing uh, in the spring, mowing the cover crop, and until the crop gets harvested and all of that fall stuff and cover crop stuff is just in overhead for us because it's easier. I'll just chime in on one point on that. I guess the idea of leaving labor in overhead like might seem like it's not getting captured, but the way that I would try to get to that number and back into it would be um, if you know your total labor costs for your operation, and this might be diff a different way to think about it, but including your own time, like a desired salary as part of that total, so you'd have like a total payroll number for your whole operation. And then if you hypothetically could account for all your direct labor, which would be all the labor that is specifically attached to um, particular crops and direct to those crops and will vary with the amounts of production, then you would be able to identify this number that's more of a common labor cost that would be in that overhead pot. So I think the point being that like, it's not that that, it's not that that indirect labor um, that's in your overhead doesn't matter or doesn't count, and it could in fact be quite significant, um, but it's more a question of, um, do you really want to um, you know, assign it specifically to individual crops or not, or how are you treating it? And how do you get to that number? And so it, I think it does take either an estimation, which I think the, a, a, the tool now Travis might use like a 10% rate for indirect labor. You can enter one. Um, and I think Wiswall uses a rate. So he came up with some rate for indirect labor. And I asked him, what, where did that come from? And it was like a, an estimate. <laughs> um, but I think that's an important number to pay attention to and like focus, look at your efficiencies um, with that indirect time, but just being careful about um, how you assign it to particular crops and make decisions about crop profitability based on a, a labor activity that essentially isn't the fault of that crop, but is more of a common cost is just a piece of the perspective. I had a question about, um, like, as you guys are sharing some of your examples and the, uh, you know, um, costs versus your net profit, but entering maybe from other people in the room too, like there's a, such a wide range and like what uh, are, what's the, what are people shooting for? Like some people are doing seed crops and also selling vegetables simultaneously. Others are just focusing on seed. I'm, I don't know. I'm just curious what there's like, a, it's a range. You have so many different ones. They all like, what's, what's the magic number? like on on our on our contract beet crops 
when you look out on a good field and you know you got good yield, good quality, good germ, good purity, 10,000 an acre is a pretty good number. To, to, and that's just, um, that's more of a gut level feeling. <laughs> um, that would be great, but even 10,000 gross per acre on a, on a mediocre good crop. Um, and it's like, again, on my gut level, half of that would be net, half would be gross on a 10,000 an acre crop. And that's, that's um, you know, that's uh, on average, that's a 10, 10 to 20 acre crop a year up to 30 acres a year. Um, and there, there is the the larger the field, the more efficient it is going to be to work. Because especially with tillage, you're, you're turning around less and, and all that. When I own my farm and go to Hawaii every year, then I'll have hit my target. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it's different for everyone and different production systems and all of that stuff. If there, if there was a goal that we could all, right. I want to go to Hawaii also. <laughs> I mean, I mean, hey, alfalfa, you might only make a hundred bucks an acre net, you know, 250, 500. So it's, I mean, it's all over the board, the more diverse you are. Um, and you're sharing the same equipment and everything. So it's, it's a tough one, Kia. I mean, I don't know if it's the right way to think about it, but I used to look at all my yields or my average um, gross income per bed, I guess, of all my crops, you know, and see what the average comes to. You know, right now it's at like $650. Yeah, I'm always looking to bump that number up because it kind of captures everything. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, if it was 10, 10,000, five, five net, five gross, on the scale, once you go up, you know, dozens of acres, your equipment gets, you got quarter million dollar tractors. So five grand an acre profit seems pretty good. Seems like we should be able to go to Hawaii, right? But you're, you just put a $20,000 engine in that combine. So... You're just uh, you're just making a lot more money, but you're spending a lot more money, is what it always seems like. There's no real silver bullet, fine line where once you're there, you're you're there. You know, you're you're constantly moving and adapting, redefining that line, um, and adjusting. Yeah. I guess I guess this wouldn't be an economic talk too if we didn't also acknowledge that. You know, you also want to look at your balance sheet, and so maybe a lot of your expenses are being investments that, you know, increase your your overall net worth, and so it might might not be income in that year, but overall it's still making the picture look good. Yeah, um, this is kind of related, but I was back to when you were talking about your overhead when you did your um, analysis. You're like, oh, I should have made more money. Um, I was just curious if. Um, when calculating your overhead, knowing that it's hard to really capture everything, um, would you ever kind of go through that and then say, okay, plus plus ten percent? Because I just want to make sure that I have a kind of a cushion and apply a little extra so that you can kind of hedge your bets a little bit and maybe plan for a little more expenses. And then, yeah, just curious. Well, I want to I want to do what Tanya said and just. You know, how much money did I want to make? How much money did I pay my crew? You know, subtract all the other expenses. And then, you know, if you try to reconcile all of those things, then you should be able to come up with more or less what did you spend on overhead or, or on management. You know, how much – right now I'm not keeping track of my – how much time am I in the office versus how much time am I in the field? How much time am I on the phone? All of these other costs – they're kind of lumped together. So yeah, needing to do that subtraction from what the total was. And then I have to, but I have to add in all my 40 crops 
to figure out what time I spent on those. So it's a so well, I guess to clarify, there there's you can you can uh, look at what you did do the year before, but then when you're trying to project out into the future, maybe something that you haven't grown yet, so you're it's it's sort of projecting, then it gets a little harder. rather than looking back at your, your QuickBooks, all your expenses that you have in the past. But. For all of the budgeting that I do, it's low yield, high expense is is what I go with. And if it makes sense at that projection, then um, it's good to go. And it's good news in the end, mo almost always. Yeah, uh, for Sarah, um, I was just curious, when you did that analysis, did you have any idea what percentage is kind of optimum for the bulk versus packeted seed? I mean, that's for a lot of people here, packeted seed is their business, not the other two guys, but you. And then it seemed like the bulk was kind of an opportunistic thing that you just kind of added on there, but it did help you get rid of some of your inventory. Right. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I have been trying to grow seed to be the seed company that I want to be. I've been trying to scale my production up and, and improve my skill set so that I can be efficient at a larger scale, um, hoping that more of that uh, bulk seed sales will come through. Um, so that's, that's why we have been growing that and that's why it's been included but there isn't an optimal ratio it's just yeah. like i'm gonna i'm gonna see what i can do with this amount and um see how it pencils out all right well let's say thanks and oh did you have one?